In many ways, the week begins today. Big Tech reporting after the close, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Your countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, Xi throws markets in China a stimulus lifeline. Europe's economy is looking worse, not better, as the Fed attempts to secure a soft landing. We begin with the big issue, global divergence. There's definitely a divergence uh, when you look across the major economies. Divergence globally. Different economies are starting to diverge. Well, when we look to the U.S. There has been um, promising signs in the, the data. The soft landing scenario is definitely being discussed a lot. Any potential recession is, is still a ways off. Growth, I would say, is holding up much better compared to Europe. European growth is kind of flat. We've seen the data weaken quite materially. Weaker manufacturing activity. Europe is definitely weaker. Or European risk assets. I don't think it's a great setup. This isn't a great setup. What we've seen, you know, from China is this constant China headline development of more stimulus. The China recovery story has done really nothing. You shouldn't bank on China really lifting all boats. Joining us now to discuss PIMCO's Tiffany Wilding, PGM's Mike Collins. To the two of you, thanks for being with us. And Tiffany, first to you, just how much of a split are you and the team at PIMCO seeing emerging here between the United States, Europe and China? Yeah, well, the, the, the PMIs have definitely, um, you know, started to, to diverge, uh, with Europe uh, being a lot worse. Uh, you know, now, uh, we, we knew that, that China also, there was going to be downside risk. And I think the key issue with China is, is stimulus that, that the, the policymakers are going to input into the economy. You know, does that, um, you know, does that sort of lift all boats? We think probably no is the answer. Uh, it's going to be much more targeted, um, and, and there's much more uh, wiggle room uh, for downside risks on, on Chinese growth moving forward. Now, you know, uh, despite all of that, the global, uh, weaker global backdrop, the United States actually looks relative, it has been looking relatively uh, resilient uh, here. So, you know, certainly um, interesting dynamics happening in the global economy. It's an amazing backdrop right now. Mike Collins, we've got this amazing situation where we're talking about the Fed engineering a soft landing, Germany in recession, and China needs a stimulus effort. What are you focused on this week? Yeah, the uh, divergence everybody's talking about, uh, Jonathan, I think is going to be really hard to, to be sustained, right? At some point, either Europe and China will have to bottom out and recover, or I think the U.S. will likely be dragged down a little bit. But we're really focused on the bottom up. What is happening with corporations? What is happening with consumers? Uh, what is happening with activity from the bottom up? And so far, again, in the U.S., the signs are still <clears throat> pretty good. There are probably more companies that are doing well. Uh, GM just reported this morning, right? And they just keep raising prices on cars. They're increasing their forecasts. I mean, there are big parts of the U.S. economy that continue to show this the tremendous resilience. So that's really where the rubber meets the road. How's in recovering? You mentioned GM raising their outlook, 3M a little bit earlier this morning, raising their outlook for the year as well. Tiffany, when it comes to U.S. economic growth, have you been raising your outlook for this year and beyond? Yeah, I, I mean, certainly things have, have looked a lot better than we thought they would at the beginning of, of this year. Um, you know, but, but I would say, though, that the U.S. economy does face some headwinds into the back half of this year. Um, you know, the first one is just the fact that student loan payments are going to restart. Uh, you know, we've, had, we've, we've seen some research that suggests that the people that, um, you know, didn't have to make those student loan payments actually took out more debt, thinking they never would have to. Um, so those are increased uh, interest rate, uh, interest cost burdens that the consumer is going to have to weather. You know, and the other thing is, is that, you know, although regional banks, you know, reporting season has been relatively good news, still credit creation uh, from these regional banks to the broader economy is slowing. And, and that's going to weigh on the small and mid-sized businesses, you know, which are the growth engine, um, you know, from a labor market perspective. So we think these things are in the back half of the year going to, you know, they're still going to put weigh on the U.S. economy and result in it slowing. Demand for corporate loans over in Europe just dropped off a cliff. We saw that in the lending survey out of the European Central Bank. We're seeing this from the IMF just moments ago, raising their outlook for global GDP. Bloomberg's Mike McKee has the story. Morning, Mike. Good morning, John. Yeah, we do have some new numbers from the IMF as they nudge growth up around the world. 
Not everywhere, though. The United States not doing as well in 2023 as they had thought. But here are the numbers. The world growth is going to come in about two tenths higher in 2023, 3%. U.S., though, is only at 1.8%. And look what happens in 2024, a real slowdown. Talk about diverging growth because the rest of the world grows faster for the most part. Uh, China a little bit slower, but for the most part, the rest of the world is going to grow faster in 2024, according to the IMF. Now, does anybody care what the IMF thinks? Uh, not down at 20th C Street. The Fed is going to make its own decisions about what's happening. But here's the difference between what the IMF sees for the U.S. economy and the Fed. And I threw in the Bloomberg Economist survey from earlier this month. And you can see the IMF is much more optimistic about the U.S. for 2023 and about the same for 2024 as the Fed, but the economists are more optimistic and much less so for 2024. Makes for an interesting discussion as they get ready to do uh, their rates. And then you can take a look here at uh, what the Fed thinks in terms of the inflation rate going forward and the unemployment rate. Fed is much higher in most cases, except for in 2024, economists think we're going to see a uh, much higher uh, a, uh, unemployment rate. But uh, at this point, the Fed has all these numbers to deal with. And as Tiffany said, the possibilities of a lot of things going wrong in the back half of the year. So it's going to be an interesting meeting. They don't put out new forecasts, but it'll be interesting to see what Jay Powell has to say about it. And that's the key caveat with the IMF forecasts all the time, Mike. You read them out and then you say, does anyone care? Mike McKee yeah. on the IMF forecast from the International Monetary Fund, raising their outlook for GDP, for the global economy, some subtle nuances between different regions and countries, of course, there always are. Tiffany, you talked about the prospect of weakness in the second half and student loan repayments are something a lot of people are focused on too. We've got this deceleration, this disinflationary trend in the backdrop as well, in the background. And Tiffany, I wonder from your perspective, can you identify just how much of that deceleration in inflation that we've witnessed seen so far experienced has been a consequence of the tightening of the last 12 months from the Federal Reserve? Yeah, I mean, frankly, I think uh, very little of it has. You know, so interestingly, uh, uh, inflation is always a lagging indicator, but it seems like this cycle, inflation is, is actually leading uh, a little bit here. So inflation's coming down without an increase in the unemployment rate, you know, which just suggests that the reason why inflation's coming down is because we're finally getting these pandemic-related shocks to inflation uh, that are fading. And we think that's definitely going to be the case, even going into the September uh, FOMC meeting. So there's going to be some nice tailwinds that the Fed is going to get on the inflation picture, you know, from a decline in used car prices, which were, you know, very idiosyncratically increased throughout the pandemic. But you also have shelter prices, which are, are going to moderate. So that's going to be a tailwind for the Fed in the back half of this year. But the key question in our view is what does wage inflation do? Because if wage inflation remains sticky, which we think that it could as labor markets remain tight, you could actually see some reacceleration uh, in core inflation. Um, um, and into 2024. And um, will the Fed tolerate that, Tiffany? Because in your secular outlook, you guys, the team, Tiffany, you and others, suggesting that maybe they will tolerate two point something. Maybe not three or four, but two point something. Yeah, I mean, certainly they, you know, I think they could definitely tolerate a, a little bit of a, above target inflation. You know, ultimately, um, you know, but, but the question is, is, is how much? Um, you know, they're not going to want to push the unemployment rate even higher, I think, if you do get inflation that's sort of running above uh, above 2 percent. You know, they could continue to forecast it moving back to 2 uh, as a result of monetary policy lags, but it kind of never really gets there. You know, now, in terms of the, the near-term trajectory of the Fed, you know, we think obviously they're going to be hiking in July. July, you know, could hike again, uh, maybe in the back half of this year, but maybe not because inflation, the inflation picture could look good. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be cutting uh, rates uh, until they see, uh, you know, more evidence that the labor market is weakening and, and they're less worried about these sticky wage inflation trends. Mike, Tiffany mentioned the lags in policy. When do those long and variable lags start to bite from your perspective? Yeah, they're, they're biting, right? As, as Tiffany mentioned, I mean, they're hitting the most levered, uh, the most susceptible consumers, corporations, obviously any um, company with a floating rate uh, loan, uh, and you see that in the real estate market, uh, it hits pretty hard. So it's already happening uh, as all of this debt, uh, which had been refinanced, you know, over the last couple of years, Jonathan, at really low rates, 
starts to roll over, uh, that really starts to bite. And you're seeing, you know, like the average life of the high yield market is really short right now, right? They pushed out their, their maturities, but but they're going to have to pay the piper over the next couple of years. So that's when it really uh, starts to bite. But I don't think the Fed is really going, going to allow uh, inflation to stay elevated. They're going to keep that funds rate, Jonathan. This is the key point, way above inflation, mean, meaning they're going to maintain a really high positive real funds rate uh, potentially for a long time, right? And, and that will weigh on growth ultimately. Chris Mamani is joining us a little bit later this hour, making the same point. So we'll discuss what that means for the equity market. Mike, can we just sit on the credit market a little bit longer and the prospect of defaults climbing from here? Torsten Slock of Apollo, a man I'm sure you know well, wrote this this morning, that markets aren't taking the ongoing rise in default rates for high yields and loans seriously. He said many investors argue this is just a normalization or these companies are companies nobody has heard about. He said the reality is that more and more companies are defaulting because the cost of capital is higher. Higher cost of capital is precisely how monetary policy works, obviously, by making it more difficult to get financing. And he ended with this line. I think this is important, Mike, and I'd love your comment on it, your reaction. All investors should have a view on how high they think default rates will go during this cycle. Do you have a view on that right now, Mike? And does that back up why you're still underweight, both investment grade and high yield at the moment? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we definitely have a view. And, and the view is that the default rate is going to increase, right? That's really a foregone conclusion. The question is, how, how high does it get? And our view is that, you know, it goes from, you know, it's been kind of 1% to 2% for the last year or two, really low. And it's going to go to 3 or 4%, which is actually close to, maybe even slightly below, this historical average. And in, in a world where the default rate is averaging, let's say 4% a year, Jonathan, the average uh, spread on the high yield market that you need to compensate for that is about 400 basis points over treasuries. Today, that spread is right around there, right? So if, if you have the view that the, the uh, rise in default rates is going to be rather benign, the high yield market is a little expensive right now, maybe fair value or a little expensive. Of course, the, the risk is uh, that the default rate goes to five or six, even for a short period. But um, but we're really in the pretty benign default scenario camp. Mike Collins, Tiffany Wilding, two of the very best, just awesome, going into the Federal Reserve decision tomorrow. That two-day meeting commences today. Your equity market, just slightly negative on the S&P 500 with some movers going into the open. Here's Abby. Hey, John, and we actually have some breaking news uh, on this morning, just a couple minutes ago, with Amazon IROC Robot amending their acquisition price uh, to $51.75 per share from $61 per share. The price change reflects the iRobot uh, entering into a $200 million financing facility to fund its ongoing operations. So this new price basically uh, takes into account that debt on this iRobot is is on pace, I believe, for its worst day this year. Turning to some other movers on the morning, GE, they basically put up a blowout beat. They lifted their outlook on surging aerospace demand, plus the uh, re rebound in renewables. RTX, they recently changed their name from Raytheon Technologies. Uh, that stock is sliding pretty significantly at this point, down about 9%. They disclosed an engine defect in a quarter that otherwise beat on the surface, but that is weighing on free cash flow. And then finally, Spotify, down about 6%. Their revenue uh, miss offset the subscriber forecast. That stock, though, John, up more than 100% into this year. Price for perfection, they didn't get it. The stock is down. Abby, thank you. Much more on the earnings front around the open and bow. Coming up next, China's latest stimulus efforts fueling a big rally. China is one of our preferred markets within emerging markets. We think that policy stimulus is important. Uh, markets had relatively low expectations coming into the Politburo meeting. That conversation up next. China is one of our preferred markets within emerging markets. We think that policy stimulus is important. Uh, markets had relatively low expectations coming into the Politburo meeting. I would say the overall measures we got yesterday was slightly more dovish than people expected. The details of what the, the actual measures will come through in the next kind of weeks and months are important to look out for. 
China's latest stimulus efforts finally starting to win over some investors. The Hang Seng Enterprise Index recording its best day of gain since November, back when China started easing COVID restrictions. The yuan, the currency, touching its strongest level in more than a week. Strategists over at Morgan Stanley saying this, overall we believe the statement exceeded investor expectations and effectively gives the state council a green light to provide further easing measures in the next few weeks. Enda Curran joins us now in Washington, D.C. for more. Enda, let's start there. What kind of easing measures can we expect in the next few weeks? Well, I think it's the tone of the messaging from the Politburo that's excited global investors, John, more than the actual substantive. We haven't had too much by way of detail, but the broad expectation is we will see more measures to boost the housing markets and make it easier for developers to finish projects and for people to buy new homes. There's expected to be uh, some measures to boost local government financing, maybe let them sell bonds so they can build more infrastructure projects. And then on the consumer side of things, measures there to boost household spending on appliances and furniture on the like. Now, the, the critical sentence that came out of everything for the Politburo was the line that they dropped, which is houses are for living and not for speculation. That line was taken out for the first time since 2019, hinting perhaps at something of a reprieve for the real estate sector. So as I say, a shift in the tone more than the substantive, but maybe those details will come over the coming weeks. And you were in Hong Kong, you're in Washington now. A feature of this conversation this morning is just the differences emerging between, say, China, Europe and the United States for that matter. Could you frame that for us, Senator? Just the difference right now between what China's going through and what the US is experiencing? Yeah, so the big story was meant to be China would help reflate much of the global economy this year. It has to some extent, but it's fallen short, John. It's not, we're not seeing the spillover from China to trading partners, either via services channels like tourism or education, or via demand for commodities. And the end result has been, when you look at the US, consumer story is pretty robust, pretty healthy. The talk of a recession has been pushed back again. But China, of course, is heading the opposite direction. Consumer has disappointed, still spending, but disappointed. And of course, they're not talking about inflation, they're talking about deflation there. So definitely a divergence in the performance. But all that said, China should still be on track to hit the 5% growth target, backed by the measures announced by the Politburo, which of course would still be a pretty healthy growth clip for an economy of that size. And thank you, sir, on the latest. And Karen down in Washington, D.C. Those announcements from that Politburo, of course, made yesterday. The market reaction in today's session in China responding to it. A lift in Chinese equity markets. You don't see that state side. Equity futures negative this morning by 0.05%. About 10 minutes out from the opening bell. Federal Reserve decision, two-day meeting begins today. Decision, of course, tomorrow. With a final word on that, Tiffany Wilde and Michael Collins back with us. <laughs> Tiffany, the guide for tomorrow. The question I've asked repeatedly in the last week, is this Fed one and done or is there more to come? What do you think? Well, I mean, clearly, uh, you know, my central ball is probably just as, as uh, or my cent my crystal ball is just as cloudy as, as yours. But but ultimately, I think it's going to depend on inflation as well as the growth trajectory in the back half of this year. And and we think that's going to look very different than the first half. So the first half, we saw growth uh, reaccelerating on a real basis. Um, you know, as as consumers had more uh, real spending power. Uh, you know, energy prices falling down. Um, and, but we also, uh, you know, we also saw inflation that was a little bit more sticky than than many people were thinking in the back half of this year, we think inflation really starts to decelerate. And as I mentioned before, there's some real headwinds to economic growth um, as a result of, of, of lower, uh, tighter credit conditions and, and, of course, the student loan issue. So we think that's probably going to be enough for the Fed to uh, to hold rates steady after this meeting. Um, you know, but of course, you know, <laughs> things can change. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get a lot more data between now and then to try to figure this out. They've changed five different times this year already, as you all know, Michael. <laughs> Colin, same question to you. Yeah, they're going to hike <clears throat> tomorrow, obviously. Uh, that'll probably be their last one uh, for the cycle. But I, I may have said that same thing uh, <laughs> a year ago. So it, it is it is difficult. But but our guess is, again, given all those leading indicators rolling over, that they're done uh, after tomorrow. And in a year from now, <clears throat> the funds rate will be lower, probably you know 50 to 100 basis points lower, but probably not go as low. It's what the markets have been pricing in. So that's really the, the, the view here. So I hear from other people as well. Tiffany, let's finish there. Michael Collins talked about the prospect of higher real rates for longer. Do you see evidence that this economy can tolerate that? 
Yeah, well, I mean, it's a little bit tricky because it all gets back to um, how monetary policy uh, lags are working. You know, and are they longer or, or maybe shorter this time? You know, fa various Federal Reserve officials have argued maybe they're shorter. But I think that the increase or the, the balance of evidence that we're getting is, is that maybe they are a little bit longer. You know, maybe the pandemic-related uh, stimulus and, and some of the backlogs from bottlenecks is just creating much more runway. Um, you know, so that, uh, you know, suggests that maybe they do need to keep rates higher uh, for longer. You know, but nevertheless, at some point, these kinds of stimuluses are going to run out. And the question is, what happens then? Uh, and is and it, does that increase the potential for some nonlinear effects, i.e. the economy weakens in a, in a kind of surprisingly strong way at some point in the future? And of course, economists are historically very terrible at pinpointing when recessions occur. You know, so, you know, take this for what it's worth. But, you know, ultimately, these are the kinds of things we're going to be looking at as we move into 2024. We know how it's worked so far this year. You just keep pushing out the call. Just another three months. Just keep pushing it out. Tiffany, it's been wonderful to catch up. Thanks for being with us today and carving out some time in your schedule. Likewise to Michael Collins. A busy couple of days for those guys and, of course, for everyone going into this week. With tech earnings after the close, Federal Reserve decision tomorrow, ECB Thursday, BOJ on Friday. Equities right now on the S&P 500 just turning negative in the last 20 minutes or so. In the bond market, just to round things out for you, looking at Treasuries, just slicing up the yield curve, twos out to 30s. Your two-year yields up a few basis points, up by four on a two-year this morning to about 490. Your 10-year at about 391. 30-year about 395. Coming up the morning calls and later, Lafayette's Krishna Mamani sounding the alarm on the bond market this time, saying the long end looks vulnerable. We'll catch up with him, plus Evercore's Mark Mahaney setting the stage for big tech earnings with Microsoft and Alphabet results coming up a little bit later after the close. Five minutes away from the opening bell, equities just a touch negative on the S&P 500, down by 0.06%, call it 0.05, not much at all. On the Nasdaq 100, a little bit of a lift up by 0.2%, going into tech earnings a little bit later. If you get to the FX market, the euro negative for a sixth consecutive session. Longest three so far this year, going back to September of last year. Euro weakness against the dollar. The data out of Europe, yesterday the PMIs. Germany today, just not great. Euro dollar right now, 110.27. That's the price action. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Piper Sandler upgrading Walmart to overweight with a street high 210 price target, expecting the retailer to benefit from the inflationary environment. City downgrading Goldman to neutral, seeing a balanced risk reward and challenging backdrop for investment banking. We're down there by 0.9%. And finally, New Street Research upgrading Meta platforms to buy, highlighting positive feedback and growing excitement surrounding, guess what, recent AI efforts. That stock is up by another 1%. Coming up, Lafayette's Chris Mamani joins us for the opening bow. Plus, looking ahead to big tech earnings with Evercore's Mark Mahaney, Microsoft and Alphabet. Coming up after the closing bow, your opening bow is just around the corner. Twenty-four seconds away from the opening bow this morning. Good morning. Coming up a little bit later after the close this afternoon. Microsoft and Alphabet. Microsoft so far this year at forty-four percent. Google at thirty-eight percent. These are big year-to-date gains. Looking for some validation. Equity futures a bit softer. There's your opening bow. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. Treasury yields looking a little something like this. Your ten-year yield higher by four basis points. Three ninety-one sixty-two. The dollar showing some strength. Euro dollar one ten twenty-seven. And that's some euro weakness right there. Negative 0.33% on that currency pair. The longest losing streak for the euro against the dollar going back to late September of last year when king dollar was absolutely crushing the euro and sterling as well. In the FX market, that's the story of the moment. In commodities, crude just a little softer, lighter, lower. We're negative there, a tenth of 1%. $78 and about 64 cents on WTI. 
30 seconds into the session, your equity market looks like this on the S&P, just slightly negative. On the Nasdaq, just slightly positive. One stock to watch at the open, 3M. The company topping earnings estimates and raising its outlook after implementing sweeping cost-cutting measures just last year. The CEO is saying this, the actions we took to strengthen and restructure the company led to reduced costs and better than expected margins and free cash flow. Abby has more. Morning, Abby. Morning, John. And yeah, the stock is popping and everything you just mentioned. And it was basically a blowout quarter. They beat uh, revenue by uh, about 6%. They beat adjusted earnings by 25%. Not small numbers either. $2.17 cents in adjusted earnings on $8.3 billion. So this company sells, as you know, everything from tape to auto parts, electrical components, and so, so much more. So the point there is it's a very broad read on the economy. So the fact that they beat, that is a positive. But there was a reason for the adjusted earnings beat being so outsized, having everything to do with those cost-cutting uh, measures that you were talking about, the margins. Uh, sales declined, though this is a positive. Organic sales declined 2.2 percent, much better than the expectation of a decline of 4.5 percent. They did take a $10.3 billion charge to settle their part in a forever chemicals case. But overall, the company says that the goal of all of this uh, is to position the company for the future. Speaking of the company, they raised the outlook. They're now looking for a range of $8.60 to $9.10 in adjusted earnings up from the previous range. All is well here. The one thing, though, is, John, because of some of the litigation hanging over the company, the stock is down 10 percent. But with this sort of an outlook, who knows? Maybe it is on the move toward a more positive year. It's up this morning, 3M, advancing by 3 percent. Abby, thank you for that. Spotify delivering a miss on revenue, to be specific, which overshadowed its monthly active user forecast that was better than expected thanks to younger listeners. Simone Foxman has more. Morning, Simone. Morning, John. Yeah, those user numbers coming in really hot, stunning Bloomberg intelligence for the like. Um, but uh, total active users up 551 million, especially because of Gen Z. However, those weaker financials really weighing on the stock this morning. Shares now down around 9 percent after falling substantially in the pre-market. Was that miss on revenue? Um, slightly below Wall Street's forecasts as well as the company's own estimates. It was also uh, the worries about the margins. Gross margin coming in at 24.1 percent. They've been hanging around that 24, 25 percent level even though the company in the long term wants to get to 30 percent gross margins. They're looking for 26 percent next quarter but analysts not really sure how they're going to get there. We've seen a sell-off since July 19th. The sell-off that J.P. Moore Morgan says is overdone, but when you look at gains this year, there's, the stock's still up about 90 percent. So we'll see how uh, traders try and parse all this data today. Simone, thank you. On course, if we close around these levels right now for the biggest one-day drop going back to December of last year. So worst performance of the year so far intraday. Spotify at the moment, fourth day of declines for that stock. I want to turn to the auto sector. GM out with earnings this morning. The car maker raising its outlook amid strengthening demand for its diesel fueled SUVs. The CFO Paul Jacobson catching up with us a little bit earlier this morning. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to raise prices across the board. We see a lot of stability in the market. Um, we're just kind of taking it one day, one month at a time and, uh, and watching the results come in. We've got to be focused on quality and we've got to be focused on getting production in the vehicles that customers want. Joining us now is David Welch, Bloomberg's very own. David, I have to say he sounded upbeat. Were there good reasons to be upbeat? General Motors hit it out of the park in terms of beating estimates. Uh, they hit it out of the park in terms of rating, raising guidance for the year. So they've got good demand. Uh, prices actually increased uh, first quarter to second quarter, and they're saying that's going to be stable. And, and, and we're talking about prices that are already at historically high levels. So the, the scene is all set for GM to make a lot of money. Uh, I still think there, there's an overhang on the stock with investors that there could be a strike this fall, which last time it happened, it cost GM more than $2 billion. And I, I do think still there's, there's kind of a wait and see on GM's electric vehicle program, which is kind of stuck in second gear at the moment. So, uh, the, you know, look, great performance from the company. They're cutting costs. They're, they're you know, growing market share on that old internal combustion side of the business. But there are a few things that investors, I think, are still taking a wait and see attitude about. Well, At least David, they were with pre-market trading, for sure. What would you point to right now based on the, the early price action when the numbers came out and they came out a little bit awkwardly, but we won't go over that now. Looking at the stock down by four or five percent, that's not what I expected when I first saw the numbers this morning. 
Yeah, I do think because GM had such a great second quarter in terms of unit sales in the U.S., which drives most of their profitability, and that news was out early in July. Uh, so some of this was already baked in. Investors knew it was going to be a very good quarter in terms of selling trucks and SUVs where they make a lot of money. Um, you know, I, I do wonder if you know the fact that CEO Mary Barra specifically called out labor negotiations in her letter, if that sort of reinforced fears among investors that there could be a strike this year, that you know maybe thou, thou doth protest too much about uh, the, the market's fear of, of a labor contract year. And, and UAW President Sean Fain has had some pretty fiery rhetoric about negotiating with the big three and how much money they're making. I think, I think there's some of that. And the EV story is still not fully baked enough at General Motors to, to garner a lot of uh, enthusiasm but you know it, it could also be just an issue of okay this is as good as it gets in terms of GM's profitability and that's always kind of been an issue with the Detroit car makers they have a great quarter and Wall Street just doesn't believe there's much on the other end of the rainbow so they don't really buy in stocks down four percent right now David thanks for the update David watch there on the latest from General Motors. Let's turn to the home builders. What a bright spot so far this year in the equity market. Pulte Group, topping profit and revenue forecast thanks to continuing demand for new homes. The CEO is saying this, while there remains an extremely limited supply of existing homes, we have a much improved supply chain that has us well positioned to meet demand going forward. Katie has more. Hey, Casey. Hey, John. Currently, you look at the stock market. Shares are about 3% higher at this morning after, like you mentioned, Pulte Group beat on second quarter estimates. We're talking revenue, adjusted EPS, and homes closed all came in higher than estimates. However, unit backlog, it did increase to a value of $8.2 billion at the end of the second quarter. That's up from about a value of $7.9 billion at the end of the first quarter. Now, also, as you mentioned, CEO Ryan Martin. He did say that Pulte Group is well positioned here to meet that demand going forward as existing home supply remains extremely limited. That's a similar message to what we heard from Dr. Horton just last week, that there's just not a lot of housing supply in this economy. And of course, that's been a tailwind for these home builders uh, all year, really, from that demand standpoint. And now they have to continue to deliver that supply. Look at Pulte Group again, currently higher than 3%. For context, it's already up 76% so far this Year. year today gains are just phenomenal it's just unreal to see what the home builders have done katie thank you thank you for that crystal mamani of lafayette expecting the solid economic landscape to keep a floor under stocks and writing this housing remains strong manufacturing data is actually recovering that and valuations will keep equities in a range but makes the long end of the bond market very vulnerable which in turn makes every part of the market very vulnerable chris i'm pleased to say joins us now so, Krishna, let's get straight into it. A bond market, the 10 year right now is at 390. When you say vulnerable, what are you thinking here? 50 basis points, 100 basis points? Can you put a number on it? Yes, uh, I, I don't think it's 100 basis points. I think four and a half is probably the top end of the range uh, uh, for 10 year. The, I, I think a couple of stories that you just talked about kind of highlight why, why the bonds, uh, the long end of the bond market may be vulnerable, which is. Uh, look at housing. Housing is doing spectacularly well, uh, at least new construction, if not uh, existing home sales. And, and I think in that sort of an environment, the risk of a re-acceleration in the economy is substantial. And I think it's that risk that makes the long end of the market far more vulnerable. The, the talk of a recession has been postponed and it probably gets postponed even early 2024. So I think that's not the driver that can take rates lower. On the other hand, any whiff of a reacceleration, and we get through 4% very quickly. So Krishna, in the last 30 minutes, we caught up with PIMCO. Tiffany Wilding told us that student loan repayments resume later this year. We know that. She expects them to bite growth. She's looking for a deceleration in economic growth because of some of that and other things too. What would you push back against to say that's not the case? Well, so I think that there are two basic uh, uh, kind of drivers there. One is employment. Employment is not showing any sign of slowing whatsoever. And as long as that is the case, uh, real incomes are increasing. That supports consumption. So that's one thing. And the second thing is the cyclical part of the economy. Housing, for example, is, remains extraordinarily strong. And uh, manufacturing, which we were counting on to kind of drive the slowdown in a potential recession, is kind of stabilizing. With all the fiscal stimulus that is still in the system and likely to remain in the system for an extended period of time, 
I don't think it's very unrealistic to expect a modest reacceleration. And a modest reacceleration is all we need for this, uh, uh, for the long end of the market to become very vulnerable. So, Krishna, is that good or bad for stocks? Well, so I, I think stocks are okay because uh, you know nominal growth is pretty high, and as long as that is the case, and uh, we are still in a, a, a stimulative environment in terms of fiscal policy, I, I think stocks probably hold their own. They probably don't go to uh, 4,800, 4,900 anytime soon, but I think they can hold uh, this middle of 4,000s range uh, for an extended period of time. I think if rates go meaningfully higher, then everything kind of uh, becomes uh, far more questionable. But at the moment, I don't think that is the case. Do you anticipate that given what you're looking for, the chairman of the Federal Reserve has to manage that risk, and ultimately that could shape the message we get received from the chairman tomorrow in the news conference? Well, I think first thing is they're going to tighten. Everyone knows that. But I think there is absolutely no reason for uh, the chair to tone down anything. Uh, and, you know, but that doesn't serve any purpose whatsoever, and he probably antagonizes a lot of people on the committee. So he's, he's going to stay <laughs> on message on that front. Uh, whether they tighten in November or not, which is probably the next likely point, uh, there's a lot of time to figure, the, figure that out. Irrespective of that, uh, the real, as inflation comes down, real rates are increasing. So that is doing a lot of the work of the Fed, uh, uh, even without them raising rates. So I, I, I think... They are at a really good spot. Things are working out according to their plan. They just have to hold on to that particular position. Krishna, how difficult do you think it is to keep everyone happy on that committee right now? Well, so I, I think uh, that there are folks who are still very worried about, uh, uh, about inflation and the fact that core is not, taking, uh, 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 not coming down soon enough and the employment remains uh, relatively robust. I think that certainly creates a bit of angst on, on, for certain of the members. But I think as inflation continues to come down, uh, and uh, uh, you know, they, can't really, uh, they can't really raise too much ruckus, because if they raise too much ruckus, and as a result, uh, policies tighten significantly more, that increases the risk of uh, the soft landing that everyone is hoping for, including the hawks. Krishna Mamani of Lafayette College on the latest in this market and on the Federal Reserve. Krishna, thank you, sir, as always. Looking ahead to the Fed, that's tomorrow. That two-day meeting begins today. About 13 minutes into this session, we advance on the S&P. More recently, some underperformance in the Nasdaq over the last several days. Some outperformance today. The Nasdaq 100 higher by 0.4%. Coming up, a big afternoon for the Nasdaq. Looking ahead to big tech earnings with Microsoft and Alphabet after the close. I think everybody that wants to start these initial rollouts of generative AI, AI are paying a top dollar. This is a super cycle. Um, I just think that we may be a little bit ahead of reality. That conversation up next with Evercourse, Mark Mahaney. The rally is and has been certainly broadening out. And, and to be clear, <clears throat> through the spring, it was undoubtedly the so-called Magnificent Seven. I mean, there, I, there's a bit of revisionist history going on that somehow the broad rally has always been the case, that it's not just seven stocks. For a long period of time, it was just seven stocks. But you have a tremendous catch-up now on the part of small and mid-caps, as we know, and the rest of the index is, is, is playing a bit of catch-up as well. 40% of the S&P 500 reporting earnings this week, a critical stretch for big tech, looking to justify their valuations following the Nasdaq's best first half on record. The results coming after the closing bow with Microsoft and Alphabet, then it's Meta's turn on Wednesday. Evercore's Mark Mahaney has outperformed ratings on both Meta and Alphabet, seeing Alphabet revenue in line with expectations and saying this, we view the street's revenue estimate as reasonable, given our ad channel checks suggesting largely stable search ad spend growth, robust global trend travel demand, a potentially thawing ad winter, and FX turning to a tailwind. Mark Mahaney joins us now, Senior Managing Director at Evercore ISI. Mark, wonderful to do with this with you, as always. Ad spend is still the business at Google, so let's go there straight away. What are you looking for a little bit later? Well, I think that that quote you uh, cited earlier is, I don't think there's any change in our view there. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing small 
bits and pieces of evidence that that the ad demand is starting to improve, but they're really small. They're tentative pieces of evidence, and um, I'm not sure that Google is going to outplay uh, that uh, that uh, improvement. The checks we had showed that search growth was kind of stable in Q2, stable at a low level uh, versus uh, Q1. So there's, there's still some work that needs to be done there. And then uh, the company still on the YouTube side of the business has been working through a couple of, I think, execution issues recently and is still a little bit lagging uh, meta in terms of um, responding to the Apple privacy changes and then the impact that that's had on uh, performance marketing campaigns. So there's still more wood to chop with uh, with Google. What, what I think investors would love to see, leaving aside the ad revenue, is real signs of greater cost discipline. I'm not sure you're going to hear that from Google, though. So, uh, you know, uh, Google for us is a small buy. Meta is one of our top three picks. Google, we'd prefer that over Google, even with the, the major rally in uh, Meta shares year to date. Before we get to Meta, Mark, just one more on Google, Alphabet and AI, if we can. You and I have heard so much from so many people about this AI investment cycle boom. Is it too early to expect an incremental boost to cloud demand this quarter, next quarter and beyond? I, I think it's too early, but I, I think you're, the basic premise of your question is flat out correct, which is, um, you know, I think we're going to see broader and broader deployments of generative AI applications. And it's going to be this competitive intensity is going to be rising. There's going to be fear of missing out when it comes to not the stocks, but in terms of uh, in terms of generative AI deployments across verticals. Uh, CIOs are going to be respond responding to uh, the CEOs and and being asked, you know, what are you doing to make sure that we don't lose out? And so what I think that means is you're going to see overall rising tide for all kind of the major cloud vendors. That's Azure. AWS and Google Cloud. Now, far and away, the two biggest providers here are AWS and Azure, but uh, but Google Cloud should benefit uh, from this too. That's going to lead to greater need for uh, cloud compute and greater need for cloud storage. It's uh, it's going to be a secular driver for cloud growth that has slowed over the last year, year and a half. So you're going to see this reacceleration in cloud growth, but I think that's going to be clearer in 24 than in 23. Three stocks on the screen right now: Alphabet. And Microsoft, Alphabet and Microsoft after the close. You mentioned Meta, that comes after the close tomorrow. Year to date, Mark, you know these numbers well, up 146%. To hear you say you still like this name after gains like that gets everyone's interest. In your research, you talk about how maybe the multiple, the current multiple, provides some downside protection to an earnings miss tomorrow. Mark, for the people that haven't had the luxury of reading your research, could you explain that to people? Yeah, well, look, an earnings miss is an earnings miss. Stocks go, well, stock, uh, Meta would, would correct probably materially on an earnings miss. Same thing with uh, with Google. I do think the bar is lower for Google. I think expectations are a lot lower. But I also want to put this in context. You know, after this dramatic rise in, in Meta shares, it's trading at 17 times gap earnings. It's essentially trading at a market discount, S&P 500 uh, multiple or a slight discount to that. I don't think it should trade at a discount. I think Meta deserves to carry a 20 PE multiple, 20 times gap earnings on next year's number, because I think that's pretty close to what the earnings growth algorithm is, that the earnings growth outlook is for the company for the next uh, couple of years. So that, that massive rise in the stock year to date, the context you have to have as an investor is it massively imploded last year. Uh, uh, but fundamentals are improving. You're going to see accelerating revenue growth, margin expansion to buy back a lot of stock. And that... Um, I think it gives you a lot of support for the stock. I know the bar is going to be higher as we go through earnings season. We've already seen that with names like Spotify and Netflix. So the bar is higher. It's harder for the stocks to really trade up on earnings. But core valuation, I think, for a name like Meta is still highly attractive despite that run in the stock year to date. Mark, I've got about 30 seconds. I've got to ask you about threats for obvious reasons. Two weeks ago, I was told it was booming. Two weeks later, people are telling me it's failing. Which one is it? Oh, I think it's growing. Um, I don't know if it's booming, but it's growing. And by the way, 100 million users in five day period, that's truly exceptional. It shows you the power of uh, Instagram and the ability to turn on new features. There's a lot of things they need to do to improve the product, but I think there's a real opportunity here for this to be a lot bigger, you know, a year, two years from now than it is today. I think it's another reason to own Meta. Mark, let's do this again soon. Busy couple of days Thank for you, you, I know. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving us some time. Mark Mahaney there of Evercore on the latest with those two names. Coming up over the next 48 hours. Abby, lots to look forward to. 
Uh, certainly there is, and right now we have lots of sectors to take a look at. Not surprisingly, with the S&P 500 up just slightly, we only have a few sectors higher. Materials being helped out by 3M, tech being helped out by a lot of the stocks you were just talking about, plus uh, NVIDIA. As for the industrials, they are the worst sector on the day. I know we generally don't talk about the Dow. Yesterday, though, John, 11 up days, the longest since 2017. Let's see if the Dow can turn it around today. What's the Dow? Abby, <laughs> thank you. Coming up, your trading diary up next. The outperformance on the Nasdaq returns up 0.5% on the Nasdaq 100. On the S&P, barely positive, up a tenth of 1%, going into earnings later. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary. Microsoft Alphabet after the close. Then it's Meta's turn on Wednesday, plus a Fed decision and Chairman Powell News Conference tomorrow. ECB rate decision on Thursday. Some US GDP, and we round out the week with the BOJ and earnings from Exxon and others too. From New York City, that does it for me. I'll see you tomorrow morning to build up the coverage towards the Fed decision. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. Good luck for the rest of the trading day. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.